Well, hey friends, thanks for joining us uh, today for another conversation. Each week, uh, we're bringing you content that we hope is wise and insightful to help you navigate the pandemic uh, and make sense of your situation, maybe introduce some new skills or some new ideas or help us uh, get our lives healthy. We've been bringing a handful of different conversations your way and hoping that they're helpful for you. Today, I get to sit down uh, with pediatric psychologist, uh, Dr. Sandy Todd, and so I'm thankful for what she's going to share with us today, and uh, thanks for being with us. It's a pleasure. Thank you for asking me. Awesome. Uh, you serve at New Creation Counseling Center, which is a partner of Gainesburg Church. Correct. You also serve at Dayton Children's. Correct. Um, so tell us just a little bit about your your roles, what you do there, and what a pediatric psychologist is. All right. Well, at, at Dayton Children's, I uh, do primarily a combination of uh, assessment of children with developmental disabilities, okay. uh, including autism, primarily autism, but um, a range of other disabilities. And sure. then I also do psychotherapy and counseling to the children and their families um, about how to deal with those issues. Okay. Uh, at New Creation, I do um, a range of, um, I have a range of populations with whom I work from kind of birth to death. Yeah, uh, yeah you're not only a, a child psychologist, correct. you work with, uh, with adults as well. But, yeah. Correct. Correct, and so, um, and we work with a range of um, presenting concerns that um, that families bring with us. And so, a pediatric psychologist is um, a, one that um, has additional training beyond the doctorate in working with uh, children. And specifically, pediatric psychologists tend to have specialties in in children with medically or biologically based problems. Okay. Uh, and uh, and so for me, the training that I did was at Boston Children's Hospital in 2002, and that was working mostly with kids with autism spectrum disorders. Okay. Um, prior to that, I worked mostly with adults, and since then, I've worked with both. Okay, great. Well, thanks for that little intro. Yeah. Something else, as we were kind of chatting, uh, that was yeah. really fascinating to me, uh, is that you're not only a professional, you're a, um, you're a grassrootsy neighborhood person. Can you share just a little bit of how you and your husband have kind of gotten connected to the neighborhood where you're at? and how you try to live um, what I would consider uh, like Jesus in your neighborhood, but it's also a, a little bit radical from kind of the American dreams. Can you talk yeah. just a little bit about that? Oh, you use these great keywords. Um, yeah, I was, um, I retired from the Air Force and when we were preparing to retire, we read the book Radical by okay. David Platt yep. and became very convicted that the life we had been living up until that point was really um, not at all how Jesus envisioned his disciples' lives should be. Mm. It, our lives looked like the American dream with a little Jesus sprinkled on top. Uh -huh. You know, we were living toward the goals that um, our neighbors were trying to live toward and we were asking God to bless our goals rather than putting everything on the table for God to use mm. and asking him for direction about what he wanted us to do and then um, obeying that. And so that conviction led us to thinking about and David Platt says this in his book as well, that if you care about Jesus, then you care about what Jesus cares about. And what Jesus cares about is the disenfranchised, yeah. the people that the support structures of power don't support. Yeah, the left out, the overlooked, the marginalized, yeah. So we started to do a, a bunch of prayer and consultation with fellow believers that we respected and um, eliciting their prayers as well. And um, through a whole process, we were led to Dayton. And we had lived in Dayton before, but okay. at this time we were in Germany. Um, but wow. we, we uh, were brought back to Dayton. We think God called us there and uh, we bought an old firehouse on Xenia Avenue yeah. that we restored. Uh, that my husband restored. I would like to and say we, but I was just the cheerleader. You, but you live in it, right? But it's we live house, in it. Yeah. Yes, yes. And with the mission of just trying to be Jesus' hands and feet in the neighborhood, and that takes a variety of forms. I do therapy through for new creation. That's my office at, at, at New Hope Church, which is right across the street from yeah, my home. Yeah, we're friends of Jeff Cart, Pastor Jeff Cart, right yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We found that church online while we were in Germany, and yeah. and felt really drawn there and have That's continued great. to uh, to be drawn there. And then it, we just do a variety of things. So we've had ice cream socials sure. in the firehouse. We've volunteered at the at Ruskin School, which is right behind our firehouse. We uh, I. Um, took ballet lessons growing up, and so I taught ballet as part of the after-school enrichment, pro enrichment program yeah. that's run by East End Community Services there. Um, we're involved in New Hope Church, so we just try to listen and be as involved as possible, and that can involve like giving a neighbor a ride somewhere, or we've had homeless people want food, and we go up and make them a sandwich, and yeah. you know, just 
we, we just try to be on call for God. And it's very difficult, and I think we fail most of the time. But, <laughs> but that's our goal. So yeah. it's, our goal is to succeed in obeying and hearing him. Uh, I love that. One of the things I love about that is even if some of our, some of our listeners may not uh, be all caught up in the Jesus movement, that what you do, your professional work, is all rooted. It's very rooted. And I yeah. think uh, almost anybody can connect with that, you know, whether they yeah. agree with your faith system or not. Like, I can see there's some authenticity uh, in what you do. And so that's, that's powerful. I'm guessing that your, uh, your professional work uh, also flows from that same well, uh, which is, I think is very fascinating. So I thanks for so. sharing. Yeah. Thank thanks you. for sharing some of that with us. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to talk with you is because actually a friend and colleague reached out and said, Hey, Rusty, you're hosting these conversations. Could you speak? I've spoken with, um, another counselor, actually the director, uh, soon to be retired director uh, from New Creation Counseling. Yes. We talked a little bit about anxiety and stress um, mm-hmm. and how we navigate that. I uh, talked with a marriage counselor from New Creation, but they mm-hmm. wanted to hear from someone who specializes in working uh, with kids and thought it might be important for parents, uh, that's probably our audience and grandparents, to yeah. understand hey, how can how are our kids processing um, this, this, this pandemic, something that's certainly um, unprecedented for us, but also uh, yeah. for them. And we might have some of the language to express what we're feeling. Maybe our kids have a little harder yeah. time doing that. So uh, I wanted to ask you, in your, uh, in your practicing right now, what are you seeing uh, new themes or different things, different signs, things that we can be aware of um, as you're working with families and clients and, and kids during the pandemic? What are you seeing? Uh, I'm seeing um, nothing new, but okay. sort of many things intensified. Yeah. So a lot of parents and families are describing that um, since the stay-at-home order, kids have been more irritable, kids have been less compliant. Mm-hmm. Um, I've seen, I've heard um, families and I've seen patients um, with increased anxiety. The kids that are predisposed to anxiety have sometimes noticed an increase in okay. anxiety. Uh, I've noticed just some general, like people who live in a household are sick of one another. Yeah, and <laughs> yeah. They're on one another's nerves. Um, and, um, and then I see that um, the computer-based learning as it stands right now um, through most of the schools, which have done, I think, the best that they could. On short notice, most of our educators aren't trained to teach this way. They've been doing the best they can. But for my patients, all of whom have special needs, yeah. uh, that's not been the best modality of learning for those kids. And so they've been extremely frustrated, and their parents have been extremely frustrated trying to help them through this time. Yeah. Something that, um, that I've heard through, from, some, from several mental health experts is this kind of increase in anxiety, um, yes. or at least expressed, you know, it's being expressed. Um, before we dive any deeper into some of the other things, what can parents be on the lookout for to know if their child is you know, dealing with something um, more, maybe more than usual, if, if they're experiencing some anxiety where maybe they need to talk to someone or could use some help? Can you talk about yeah. that just a little bit? Yeah, so anxiety in kids, um, sometimes doesn't look exactly the way it does in adults. And adults, um, like you had said earlier, we can sometimes verbalize what it is that we're worried about. Sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Um, and kids oftentimes don't have the words for that. So mm-hmm. many times they'll show you or through their behavior, okay. it, they'll express it. So things like uh, difficulties sleeping, um, difficulties with their appetite, cl- being more clinging, clinginess mm-hmm. to um, caregivers, more distress when the caregiver leaves. Mm-hmm. Um, Excess, excessive reassurance seeking, like asking the same thing over and over again for reassurance, even though they know the answer, even though you've told them um, those things, difficulty concentrating on their schoolwork. Okay. Those are some of the things that um, you would, your child would kind of show you that there's something different yeah. um, going on with them. And so um, I'm guessing there are maybe um, a series of steps that a parent might take. You know, uh, the first step might not be to, to call a therapist, but at right. some point it might be as well. Um, so let's say a parent is seeing some of the signs that you just that you just talked about. Um, what are some things that they can do initially to just begin to assess and feel out, hey, is there something here that really needs some professional help or is this something I can navigate through? Yeah, I think the first question is to, or the first thing to do is to ask mm-hmm. um, them if they are able, if they're verbal, yeah. um, if they're old yeah. enough to talk and to say, hey, I wonder if you're worried about anything. We're doing new things here around the house. Things have changed around here. Do you have any questions about those? Yeah. Are you worried about that? Or I noticed that you are staying near me more. Yeah. Tell me about that. Just to kind of open up some conversation for them. I think that as parents, we oftentimes are used to um, telling our children things mm-hmm. and teaching our children children things, we're not so accustomed to listening. And so just opening up that listening, I think, is a really good idea. Um, And then even if the children don't ask or aren't able to verbalize what they're they're concerned about, to 
explain what's going on to them mm -hmm. at a level that they can understand. I think that that would be another step. Yeah. Um, reassure them that things are okay. The way you can do that also is more than just words, but through behaviors as well, because children aren't, it just like they can't speak as well, they can't understand verbally as well either, depending on their developmental level. Yeah. So doing things like setting a routine and having a very expected, predictable routine, um, as, a, as much as you can, you know, yeah. not to be too rigid about it, but to have, so that the child knows what to expect so that they can settle into this new life that we've got for the time being. Um, for the adults in the home to really be aware of modulating their own emotions, okay. regulating their own emotions, even though they might be anxious, even though someone might have lost a job or there might be someone ill or there might be uh, problems that are related to COVID-19, but not directly COVID-19. Mm -hmm. um, if a, the parent can model for the child that they're calm, that they're um, in control of what they can be in control of, that they're not overwhelmed, then the child is looking at their parent as the barometer for how they should feel. Yeah. Um, and so I think those would be steps. And then if they notice that over time, I would say a month af after they've noticed a symptom, if, if nothing has improved after they've made some of these steps, then they could consider starting to, to um, ask for professional help, explore professional help. And that doesn't mean that it would be, the child would be in therapy until they graduate from high school. Right. It might be just a couple consultation sessions right. um, with a therapist to just get some more ideas. Yeah, I think in one of my other conversations, uh, we talked a little bit about, this was in the marriage counseling or marriage conversation, that there can be a bit of a stigma where we can feel like, oh, if I, if I need help, what does that mean about me? Or yeah, or like, oh, I'm in this forever. Like, right. I was, you know, um, so it's good, I think, to alleviate kind of the concerns. Hey, this might be a conversation or two uh, where a therapist and a child and a parent learn a little bit, learn some skills um, that can help free us all up to, to move forward in health. Yeah, I like to think That's of good. it as the way you would go to see your pediatrician, mm -hmm. that you, you when you go to see your pediatrician, you, don't, you aren't sick for life. Right or you don't have an injury for life, um, they just use their expertise to give you some ideas about how to get well from this particular um, challenge that your body has faced. And, and therapists do the same thing. Yeah. That's the goal. No, that's really, really good. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, you mentioned parents modulating their own emotions. That requires a certain level of emotional well-being on parents' yes. part as well. And obviously, we're, many parents are under a like you, like you named, they're either they're working, working and caring for kids at home, or they've lost their job or whatever. Yeah. Um, what are some tools for parents to be, to be well, you know, to, so so that I can, um, so that I don't dump my anger or my frustration, yeah. or my ruminating right onto my kids or when my kids are around. What are some tools that we can use as parents yeah. to to be healthy too? Great idea. I I have um, four things that I can think of. Hopefully I'll remember them all as I yeah. talk. Um, the, the first is make sure that you give yourself a break if you're a parent. Okay. Uh, that now everybody's at home 24 seven. And so it's not like you have a rest period from where you're, you know, coming home is your rest period usually, right. but now coming home is your workplace. It's your you, on, yeah. Yeah, so to find ways to give yourself a break, um, taking a bubble bath, put on your headphones and listen to music, yeah. um, pass the baton to another adult in your home and take a walk if, if there is another adult in your home. Right. Uh, I think those, just giving yourself permission to do that because I don't think we necessarily give parents permission to have a break. We kind of guilt them into thinking they have to be on the clock 24 seven, but they need a break. Um, Second is to have somebody that they can talk to, okay. uh, another adult that they can talk to, especially if they're the only adult in the home. Sometimes we have to talk and we end up wanting to talk to, our, to somebody. And so that ends up being the, ch the children in the home and the children just maybe don't have the emotional capacity or the intellectual capacity to deal with the nuances that we adults are dealing with during this time. So yeah. have a friend to call. And if, if you don't have somebody in your social support network, then um, a clergy person or, um, or uh, a counselor for yourself yeah. is also an idea. Um, uh, the third thing I think is to uh, let yourself off the hook. Okay. Uh, for being a perfect parent. Yeah. Um, parenting, like professional parenting kind of like we ha have nowadays is relatively historically new. And it came basically after World War II. Before then, there were no books on parenting. Nobody talked about being a parenting. It was just kind of assumed that you would provide for your uh, a home for your child and they would they would grow up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and so now that we have a little bit more <laughs> uh, conveniences and more time, we're not, uh, we're not, 
farming and things like that that require all of our time. Right. We're kind of poured more, a little bit more into child caring. But the truth of the matter is that a good enough parent is going to raise a healthy, productive child. Yeah. Um, and so just a parent who is trying to do a good job and um, loves their child and is trying to provide an adequate home for them, that's good enough. Yeah. Um, so, you know, this idea about, you know, you, you have to read to your child or you have to do those things, that's good, except that nobody before my generation, nobody ever, no parents ever read to their children. <laughs> Ask your grandparents, did your parents ever read you? No, they did the not. The answer is no, okay, yeah. <laughs> and they grew up just fine. They grew right. up to be doctors and lawyers and Indian chiefs, fine. Right, right. So, <laughs> so take some of the load off your parenting for being perfect because- That's they, really know. good. <laughs> In my conversation with Kitty, the director at New Creation, she talked about being kind to yourself. You yes. know, And so that, that sounds similar to that. So you said, uh, what was the? I'm, 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 I think uh, I got three, and now I can't yeah, remember what three. my fourth, fourth one, one was. But yeah, that's a, that's okay. Yeah. That's all right. Um, taking the taking the load off, being yeah. being kind to yourself, um, taking breaks, and sharing with uh, another adult. I heard uh, on a on a podcast I was listening to the other day about uh, the kind of this idea of the double bubble for for parents who don't have another adult in the home. Like this is yes. a real deal. This is a lot of people, yes. right? Yes. Um, and they have created a uh, safe space with a close with a close neighbor or relative um, who yes. you know they're kind of monitoring. Uh, their social interactions during the pandemic so that they're they're not endangering one another but they're creating support for one another that's brilliant so I don't know if, I don't know if you've seen any of your families doing that who maybe have a single a single parent um, but they're finding another adult even if they're not in their home who they can yes. kind of have as a support person yeah I think a lot of people are doing that and I think the state of Ohio even um, Adamus board is recommending you reach out to five people a day yeah. strive for five I think is what they're calling okay. it and that's, I think that's a great idea but even if it's not five one yeah is, um, is a great idea, yeah. Um, in some of our preparation, you talked about, um, as we parent through the pandemic, two, I mean, you had these kind of these two tensions, keeping your kids safe, as well as strengthening your children yes. through pan, uh, throughout the pandemic. You've already talked a little bit about um, keeping our kids safe, talking openly with our kids, yes. managing our own emotions, um, even uh, praying with our kids and being yes. a spiritual guide for them. Um, talk a little bit about strengthening our child. In, in our prep, you mentioned uh, the greatest, the, the generation known as the greatest generation, uh, going back to the Spanish flu in the you know early 1900s and um, how how times like this can actually strengthen our kids. Can you talk a little bit about the strengthening component? How can we parent well and use this as a situation to help our kids develop and thrive? Yeah, I, I mean, that's the way we develop and thrive is to go through adversity. Okay. Uh, and so as a parent, our goal is to kind of um, walk that tension between keeping them safe and um, j challenging them so that they are um, a little bit strained, not mm -hmm. overwhelmed, right. but a little bit strained because that's how they grow. Just like when you you, you strengthen your, your muscles by lifting a heavy weight, right? Um, you you become you develop your character and your coping skills by um, going through challenges. So um, parents have to kind of look at their child and know where their child is, and um, be able to um, protect them from things that are more uh, complex and difficult that, uh, that the child can't um, handle, but give them things at their developmental level that they can handle. So. Uh, I read um, a recent publication for children about COVID-19, mm -hmm. and it talked about how to be a hero. It was written for the children, yeah. and this is probably for early elementary school. And the way they can be a hero, the way they can fight COVID-19 is to um, wash their hands and stay six feet away from people and um, reach out to people who um, they can't normally see with letters and phone calls and yeah. and social media. And so that's a way that they can be a superhero in fighting COVID-19. Yeah, I love that framing that as being heroic, not all these life limits. Stay yeah. six feet apart, don't talk, don't visit grandma, but like rather this is how you can be here. Yeah, that's this good. is how you help. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's a way that you can, um, can strengthen, especially our younger um, elementary school age and below kids. Yeah. Uh, um, kind of embrace the suck is what we used to say in the Air Force. Yeah. Also, like things are difficult, um, but kind of um, rather than, um, than lamenting how difficult it is all the time, you can do some of that, but sure. also talk about that, um, this is a challenge. You're gonna be so much stronger after you do this. This new way of learning online, uh, I know that's hard, but man, think of, um, you're gonna know how to do that now right. after this is done. Right. There's um, some new skills that you're developing throughout this that you wouldn't have developed otherwise. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, uh, things like and praising your child for their efforts. So you know when your child is learning to toddle, um, you don't 
criticize them because they're not walking with a perfectly smooth gait. You praise them for every little toddly step that they make. Yeah. Um, the same with your children at any developmental level. You know, praise their efforts and praise any progress that they're making towards the, the direction that you want them to make in this. So, um, you know, I noticed that you were annoyed with your brother today, but um, you didn't yell at them. And I was really impressed by the fact that you didn't yell at yeah. your brother when you yelled at him yesterday. How did you stay so calm today? That was really amazing. Yeah. Um, so really, um, uh, Show, you get more of what you pay attention to. Yeah. So if you pay attention to your children's efforts to um, combat this and praise them for that, then you're gonna get more of that and they're gonna be encouraged and motivated to well, do more of One of the gifts that. that parents have is that they are probably have more opportunity to pay attention than usual. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Which yes. is kind of a double-edged sword. Like, oh geez, let me away from these kids. But we're, I know that my wife and I are getting to see our kids in their learning space in ways we never had. Yeah. So we're, we're able to see, oh, this is how they learn or this is something that they're really doing well or I see they've been improving on this over the last 12 weeks, whatever. So that's really great. Yeah, and it's really cool. I mean, a parent's, a parent's attention is gold. Yeah. Um, it is the the most powerful currency that they have in their household yeah. for most kids. On kids on the autism spectrum, maybe less so, but for the vast majority of kids, their parents' attention is the commodity that they crave most. And yeah. to, for parents to give that when their child is doing well with managing this um, pandemic yeah. um, and, and adapting. Something else you shared was yeah. the uh, empowering them and including them like in decision making for your family. It's easy yes. to often like, mommy and daddy make the decisions or mommy does that, dad does that, whatever. Um, can you talk a little bit about how we can empower our kids to be a part of our family process? That seemed like a really neat, neat thing. Yeah, I think, well, first of all, um, some a lot of um, people of faith have weekly family meetings and I, I encourage everybody to have a weekly family meeting yeah. at a regular time where we discuss what's been going wrong, what's been going right, and listen to your kids' ideas about how things could be better. Listen, yeah. um, it's hard. We just use too many words at our kids. We don't listen enough. So yeah. listen to them and maybe be willing to try one of their ideas about how things we can make things work out. And um, we might be surprised in the, and it might work out that way. You know, if, mm -hmm. it might be better if their brother goes and uh, lives in the doghouse. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but even if the idea fails, right. that um, that's data and, and uh, that you can use that with, with the child for, yeah. for problem solving. So I think um, letting them have an idea and a, a, a um, possible solution yeah. for things that are going wrong or that could be better. Um, and then also many families, I think I, I heard on the radio on the way over, 50% of families have lost income in yeah. America as a result so far of the um, the COVID-19 pandemic. And so um, your family might be in the position where your budgeting is much different than usual. Um, and kids can be a part of that. You're not burdening your kids um, by giving them a tiny piece of, you know, we can um, our, we can afford either chips or cookies at the store, but we can't afford both this week. Which should we get? Mm -hmm. um, or, um, you know, we can do this or this. Wh which should we do? Um, by the time your kids are in high school, um, high school age, they can really help you with the budget and they should. Yeah. Um, so they can look and they can know what your, um, the financial constraints that your family is under and they can help make decisions. And that's great empowering, um, information for them for when they're off on their yeah, own. Yeah, great, great skills for um, moving into the future. Um, are there any tools, uh, any books, or you mentioned a, an article you read about, you know, kids as superheroes. Are there any tools or, or books that, online resources that parents might be able to have access to that, that you think of often or that you um, that you reference in your, in your work with parents that uh, parents oh. might benefit from? Um, the, that book, the, um, I think it's, it's called You Are My Hero. Okay. It's an online book only. And I okay. would imagine if you Googled it, yeah. you could get it. It's not from a faith-based perspective. It's sure. more kind of a humanistic perspective, yeah, but okay. it's still within the context of a faith-based family, you can use the information in there and discuss about it. And there's nothing that would be um, objectionable, yeah. I think, in there. Um, oh, I'm trying to think of some other... Yeah, and if there's anything that sometimes you share with some of your some of your patients or you know families that are... Uh, maybe universal resources that are helpful for uh, for parents. There's one that I use all the time called Therapist Aid, and you don't have to be a therapist yeah. to um, to do that. That has great um, interactive. It has interactive things online. Um, it has worksheets okay. um, for all age groups, especially in, especially kids and adolescents. Yeah. And um, a lot of the um, the uh, resources are free. It, you yeah. can also do it, uh, pay for a membership and get more augmented things. Sure. Also, that's called Therapist Aid. Therapist Aid. Yeah. Dot com, I think it is. Okay. Um, and then also the Children's Television Workshop, Sesame Street. Mm -hmm. 
They have an excellent internet site that's always being developed with state-of-the-art research on things that are helpful for families and children, especially young children. If you're dealing with preschool, early, out, early um, elementary school age children, they have great resources to help kids manage a variety of life circumstances. Yeah. Um, so those would be my top three go twos at this point in time. Yeah, that's great. Well, I so appreciate our conversation today. I think it's going to be helpful uh, for parents who are just trying to trying to make it work and be there for their kids. You know, I don't know a parent who doesn't want to be there uh, right. for their child. And right. uh, you've, you've affirmed, I think, parents in saying, hey, if, if you're that far along that you want to be there for your kids, you're probably being there for them. Relax. It's probably okay. And I think you've I also agree. offered us some other tools, especially this these tools you mentioned several <laughs> yeah. times of actually listening, kind of slowing down listening to our kids, uh, letting, letting their words, their feelings, their thoughts influence uh, yeah. how we interact with them. So There's one thing that I would add to that. Which yeah, this please. is a great, and you had mentioned, you guys have, you and your family have more time at home. Um, one thing that's foundational, I think, for that some families automatically do, but some good families don't automatically yeah. do it, and I would encourage them to consider it, is five minutes a day with each child one-on-one. -on -one. Okay. Um, and during that time, you are um, just following your child. Um, if they're play age, then you play with them, but you let them set the tone. You don't ask them questions during that time. You, okay. you reflect what they say. You comment on what they're doing. You praise them. Um, and um, what you're doing in that five minutes is just pouring positive attention into your child's attention bank. Yeah. Um, so that when you need to make a withdrawal, like making a re asking a request of them or having to say no when they want to do something, you, they still have a full bank yeah. of goodness from you. Um, as the children get older, you have to kind of come up with different activities, but still five minutes a day of just pouring one-on-one -on -one attention with your child where you're not teaching them, you're not correcting them, you're listening to them and just observing them and paying attention to them um, is a great foundation for a positive relationship with your child, which is the most foundational relationship yeah. of their lives yeah no pressure <laughs> the most foundational no but I love it and that's something that we can all do right five minutes a day is yeah. nothing. is there anything else you would want to share with our with our viewers or listeners today uh, I, I think limit screen screen time would be the last thing oh yeah because yeah, we're spending so much time on the screen with school yeah um, and uh, and the research shows that there are some benefits to screen time but mm -hmm. um, there are a, a whole host of um, difficulties associated with screen time. And so um, many families know this, but the American Academy of Pediatrics guidelines are that if your child is under two, they should not have any screen time. Right. If they're three to five, they should have less than an hour a day. And if they're five to 18, they should have less than two hours a day. And if you keep screen time within those limits, I mean, that's not counting educational time, but if you keep screen time within those limits, then children are relatively healthy. Yeah. But if screen time goes beyond that, your children are at a much higher risk for a, a host of, a, of obesity, sleep problems, cognitive problems, behavioral problems. Okay. So really try to limit the screen time. Yeah, there's a real link here to, it's, it's, yes. it's, it's a real deal. It's the real deal. Real yeah, deal. very strong research. Yeah. No, that's enough. good. Well, again, thank you so much for, for hanging out. Your wisdom is great. Thank and I you. can't wait for uh, our families to get to hear about it. So thanks, thanks for being for here today. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Awesome.